thank you for attending the CSI North Central Regional Virtual Conference. At this time, I would like to welcome our presenter, Travis Miller of Miller Engineering here in Springfield, Missouri. And he is also going to be the president as of July 1 of our region. Travis completed his beautiful office during a historic pandemic and our chapter couldn't, couldn't miss the opportunity to share it with everyone um, who was unable to attend his open house. So we decided to do this tour uh, back in November. I hope you enjoy the tour and the beautiful and very unique space that Travis has created. Travis, take it on. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thanks again for uh, the region allowing me to have this uh, platform to show our building off a little bit and to talk about some various structural concepts. Um, I have to give just a little bit of backstory so that all of the videos make sense and uh, give you sort of a, an overview picture. Uh, our company, you know, started off as one person and has grown over the years. And especially over the last five years, we have almost doubled in size. And we were in a facility that uh, was fairly lackluster. It was about 2,400 square feet. And literally by the time we were moving into our new building, we had so many people stacked into our office that we had desks in the foyer. I was actually sharing my office with an intern it was ridiculous. And of course, with all the COVID stuff going on, we couldn't get out of that building fast enough so that we could actually uh, do our social distancing and keep everyone safe. And of course, we had a lot of people working remotely uh, through that process to keep everyone safe. But um, it was uh, long overdue for us to get into our new building. And um, here in the Ozarks, especially, uh, I sometimes refer to it as being the pre-engineered metal building capital of the world. And it's not because we make pre-engineered metal buildings. It's because no one ever does any building here that's not a pre-engineered metal building because all they can think about is cheap, cheap, cheap and keeping everything's economical. I, I don't know if uh, if Ross uh, Morey is on the on this presentation or not, but uh, Ross, I'm not attacking you. I know you're a metal building guy. but um, you know, we, we even have a, one of our largest competitors here locally that uh, works out of a strip mall. And so it, it wasn't too hard for us to try to raise the bar, so to speak, in terms of our professionality and, and the way we look. Um, you know, we really felt like that our building needed to make a statement about who we are. And we worked so hard to educate ourselves and try to push our own limits and be the best that we can be here in this office. And it just seemed like we needed a, a shell of some sort um, that, you know, surrounded this talent and, and that was in, you know, in some way equal. And so we decided that our new building would be actually called a celebration of structure. And uh, so we sought to use all kinds of structural materials and uh, rather than cover things up, we, we, we showcase the structure. And so the people that uh, look at our building from the outside and the people that are inside the building working are immersed in structure uh, throughout the whole day. So um, hopefully you get sort of that feeling as you watch this video. Um, as, as Kim stated, it was at our open house, which was November of last year, almost six months ago. And um, so uh, where, where this uh, presentation picks up, uh, I'd been doing three hours of tours and um, we'd had, uh, we broke up all these, pe all these people that showed up into groups and took them through the facility and kept everybody safe. No one was, uh, no one got sick as a result of this event. And we, we really struggled on whether or not to do a, a um, live you know, open house or not. And uh, we were super happy that the local chapter, our, our Southwest Missouri chapter, was willing to uh, let us do this sort of virtual tour that you're about to see right now. Now, the video is actually broken up into two parts. Uh, so there'll be just a brief intermission here after about 15 minutes. And that the reason for that is as we were videoing the main level and going down into the basement, the internet changed from being upstairs to downstairs. And uh, so it broke it up. And so anyway, there'll be just be a, a brief intermission there. So I think without further ado, I will uh, go ahead and have them start the video. 
going to take off my mask because we have uh, finally kicked out about 100 people. Uh, now, not all at one time. We brought them through in small pieces, but uh, anyway, the office is empty. Um, we have several points we want to talk about tonight. Uh, we want to show off our building, but we also want this to be an educational event, so I'm going to mix that up a little bit there. Um, hopefully you come away from this with an understanding of some technical things, and then maybe um, maybe you'll enjoy the rest of it as well. Our office um, <clears throat> has a lot of small projects in it that our, our local, our, our in-house engineers and uh, employees have worked on. Right behind me, you'll see this beautiful wall here. This was actually built by Alexi Pavlov. He's one of our forensic engineers. Uh, we have a lot of people that are really handy in our office. And you can see here some of the inspiration that he had and he created this beautiful wall, which is right inside the uh, front door of our office. And Dylan, if you would, please pan over to the front door there. So that, that's where we're talking about. People walk in and then they see that wall. Next, I will direct you to the conference room. This conference room table was uh, designed by myself. And uh, you can see there we use a lot of structural steel elements. We have this frosted glass here, which is part of that. And then uh, Dylan, who's operating the camera tonight, uh, designed this, what I'm calling the, the tech desk or the tech table. And within that, we have uh, a computer that uh, is linked to our television and sound bar and camera system over here for our conference. Uh, culture of needs, and if you will, I would tell Dylan to kind of look directly behind me, and you can see kind of this wide open space here. Well, we will show you better pictures of this, but everything that you see here is actually elevated above the ground, so we'll show that here in just a second. Uh, another thing Dylan is going to show here in a moment is if you could pan up to the ceiling structure. This is a mass timber roof system, which is something that I first learned about from CSI, actually. I was at a regional conference. We had someone come down with Woodworks who was talking about mass timber roof uh, construction. And so that stuck in my mind. And... Uh, I'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, we're actually using some of that mass up there to dampen uh, waves that we may feel on the floor and things like that. But follow me real quick. I'll show you around a little bit more. <laughs> we have a garage structure over there, and within that area, there's also a small testing lab. The testing lab is still under construction, so not much to show there, but it's for our building envelope department. So they're going to be uh, taking materials in there and doing an adhesion test, figuring out compatibility. Also, uh, taking stuff through temperature changes and seeing how that affects uh, their ability to do their jobs. So, uh, excited to get involved in that, but it's just not quite 100%. Through this door is our company fitness area. So, uh, all of our employees have the benefit of having a physical uh, personal trainer a physical trainer, but a personal trainer. And um, so we have a tenant that's taking this space and they are taking in their own clients but also training us and we give them a break on the rent for taking care of our clients, or excuse me, our employees as well. So all of this equipment you see here though is owned by Miller Engineering. We've had a really robust corporate business program now for about eight or nine years. And uh, it seems to be well, so we're going to stick with it. Uh, right over here, we have a changing room, pretty simple. And then a shower room. And then I'll just show you in one of the restrooms, all the restrooms look the same. Pretty basic, pretty kind of accessible. Our printer, 
corners and plenty of space to lay things out and uh, do what we need to do. And then from this location here, you can kind of see the first hint of how we were able to suspend the entire structure above the ground. So this is a 70 foot long Baron Deal truss. And most trusses have diagonal members and horizontal members and vertical members. But this truss you'll see only has a top cord, a bottom cord, and then these vertical elements that you see down through here with very robust uh, rigid connections where the two meet. And that's, that's the definition of a Baron Deal truss. And then uh, just behind that, there's a mural on the wall. And uh, that mural is of a local project here at Springfield. It's the Springfield Fairgrounds. It's from the 1950s. On the right-hand side, there's an old racetrack. We have the grandstand there. The roof structure that they're building is still in place to this day. It sort of looks like looks like he's tethered to the uh, tethered with a rope of some kind. That's actually a welding lead. It's actually no safety whatsoever back in the day. And uh, that's just how they rolled back then. And then if I get you to pan around this direction, I'll show you another mural that we have. It's the First Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri, in the downtown area. And uh, this is also from the 50s. Also from the 50s. And it really is an amazing old construction. We have uh, the old cranes. We have workers way up here, not tethered off. Uh, the crane is actually not big enough for this job. They have it hooked here. And uh, it's sitting crooked, and they're up there trying to wrestle it into position. And uh, you can see it was quite a spectacle for all of these uh, local people that came out to watch that. Um, and then I guess of, also of interest is the fact that that cross that's at the very top actually fell out into the street a few years ago. And uh, with us offering forensic services, we uh, got the call, and I went out there and uh, – had the opportunity to climb all the way to the very top of that steeple to figure out why it uh, fell off and what to do about it. And then it was a situation where the cross itself was wrapped with copper and the copper came down to the attachment point and, and was lapped under. And it, uh, we had dissimilar metals there. We had the copper and the steel uh, bolts that were holding it on and it corroded and caused that to fail ultimately. But, of course, it did last a very long time. But you're within our, uh, comp or, excuse me, our break room right now. And this, of course, was where all the coffee is, which is the most important thing of the day. And uh, not much to see here. Come out this way. So as you're walking down through here, you can see several offices on my left. Every office has a thermostat. And, uh, so we have a, a nice sophisticated system that allows us to have people be at whatever temperature they want to be at. We even have uh, sensors out here in this open area right on top of the desktop so that the air that's dumping out onto them can be controlled and everyone can be comfortable. I'll show you something a little bit later on exactly um, another element that we have in the floor that helps us uh, to keep the temperature, but save that for later. So I just walked through the truss, and I'm at a very special location, basically. Um, if you will look down here toward the bottom of that column, um, there's a lot going on here. This, this location underneath of us, there's a single concrete column that's carrying 100,000 pounds of force. And that uh, concrete column is bearing on a seven foot by seven foot by four foot thick footing. It's embedded into our Ozarks here. And this is actually the intersecting of two Verandale trusses. So I mentioned the first Verandale truss, and then there's also another one that comes across this way. So we actually have a double cantilever situation here and where you see all of that uh, steel coming together up here in this area is where the two Berendale trusses intersect. And uh, so there's a lot of action here, a lot of things going on. 
Something else um, that you always deal with in any type of cantilever structure is you have to worry about uh, vibration. And so when people are walking around, is it going to be disturbing to the occupants? And so, of course, we were worried about that. And um, can't quite see it because the lights are off in my office, but there are a series of small columns that are installed in each one of these offices, and they don't need to be there. Their whole, pump, their whole function is to distribute or take vibration load from the floor up to the roof structure and up to this beautiful mass timber roof system that I mentioned earlier. So this mass timber roof system here, as you can see, uh, go ahead and pan it toward the television there. This was actually built by Miller Engineering employees, personal friends of mine, and family members. And we showed up at a warehouse just up the road, which you'll see right here, it's just starting. And it was the middle of February, so we couldn't risk doing it outside. So we built mass timber panels on the flatbed for this project. I will stuff that cycle through just a little bit. So there we are, uh, the Miller Engineering employees actually swung those into position. We had budgeted about a day and a half to do it, and it turns out we did it in about six hours. It was particularly windy that day, and the train operator was all nervous, but we uh, gave him some value, and everything was fine. But there you can see a good cross-section of what those panels look like. We made them in, in sizes that we could handle personally with a relatively small crane, and uh, everything went together very well. And so all that mass up there is helping to dampen the waves that the floor feels through those beams that you see there. Okay. So um, the other thing we've incorporated into this office is the ability to raise all the workstations. So this is where Dylan is. Obviously, he's drinking honey. That would never be beer. And um, so you can raise and lower your workstations as you need to. And it's just that easy. Trying to keep people comfortable. These uh, old people like me like to sit. Young people like to stand. So there you go. Around this way, you see one of those columns over there that I was talking about. Its only job is to dissipate vibration. And then we'll go downstairs and see a little bit what you of what you guys can't see up until now. With the camp So the stairs um, were actually designed by Michael Morrison from our office. And we wanted to continue our mass timber. Okay, so uh, uh, George is going to switch over to the uh, to the other video, but uh, real quickly, I wanted to interject a few things uh, to talk about some of what we saw there. Um, I think one of the questions I get asked a lot is, uh, why in the world did we, Miller Engineering, decide to take on the task of making and installing the uh, nail laminated timber elements? And uh, I will say, uh, how that all started was that I can't speak for anywhere else in the world because I was born and raised here and been here my whole life. But I can tell you here in the Ozarks, when you bring a new idea to town, everybody just needs to freak out. That's just, that's just what they do. They freak out. Everything is crazy. So um, we, this was the first mass timber project in, in our region here. And I think it was only the third or fourth mass timber project in the state of Missouri and it's, you know, relatively small. I'm not uh, trying to brag on it, but uh, 
we, uh, I had a contractor that I really trusted, someone I'd worked with for a long time, and they gave me a price to do this, uh, this wood system for me. And uh, the price came in at $30,000, and that was $30,000 in labor, <clears throat> not materials. And uh, the amount of ceiling slash roof area that that is is, is roughly 3,000 square feet. And so, um, you know, $10 a square foot in labor to make this happen. And uh, that was way outside what I had budgeted and our original construction budget. And so, um, you know, I tried talking with the contractor. I said, you know, tell me, tell me how you came up with the number. And they said, you know, what we, they had planned to just build, build it all in place. So they weren't going to make it in elsewhere and then bring it there and swing it into place the way we, the way we did and the way a normal uh, manufacturer would. Uh, so they were going to build it in place. And, you know, that was, they were literally thinking, okay, I've got to have a guy that walks from the wood pile to the saw and then a guy that's running the saw. And then I have to have a person going from the saw to the roof and someone, two people on the roof. And then I have people nailing and they figured out how much time it would take per board. And then they multiplied that times 10,000 and came up with the, you know, saying that it was going to take uh, the better part of a, a week to get it all done. And, you know, with a crew of say 10 people, and uh, it was just, um, you know, I thought it was ridiculous. And so um, I, I pulled that out of the out of the contractor's contract. I put it right in the owner's contract. And so we uh, we did what you saw there in that video, which basically consisted of me borrowing a warehouse just up the road from our construction site and um, called called in all my favors, basically. The employees were excited to be a part of that project. Um, we, we like being hands-on. Most of my employees come from the construction industry, so they're very handy people. Um, but I had friends, family, and um, just uh, anybody I could con into showing up. And uh, we showed up at the warehouse there on a Saturday morning, and there was 18 of us total. And I, of course, already had the flatbed set in there, the, the tractor trailer flatbed. And I'd already built a jig on top of the, the flatbed trailer so that we were not having to do layout. Of course, I'd already, because I'm a geeky engineer, I'd already drawn up a, basically a panel sheet for every panel and what size and everything had to be, how many boards were going to be in a panel. And then I already knew the nailing pattern. Uh, we wound up uh, shooting uh, over 30,000 nails in a, the course of about eight hours and uh, with uh, six different nail guns. And we had two very large compressors and a standby in case one went down. And so uh, we, we did that process just as I described how the contractor did it. We had somebody feeding the saws. We had someone on the saw. We had people lifting the boards onto the trailer and then people that were just nailing. And then we also had a quality control person watching everything, uh, making sure that the boards were not, uh, um, say, you know, out of alignment with each other and stuff like that. And uh, so uh, we did all that and then hauled the, hauled the trailer to the job site and swung those into place. And um, right after we got the, the panels in place, I, I put some plastic over the top of the whole roof system. Um, I couldn't get a piece of plastic large enough to cover everything, so there was a joint in it, which turned out to be my nemesis throughout that whole process. Um, uh, in the earlier presentation today that was talking about the dowel laminated timbers, one of the questions I had asked was how or if they had to do anything to protect the wood through the construction process. And I uh, asked that question because we had a lot of water staining as a result of leaving that wood exposed to the to the elements during the rest of construction, uh, despite our best efforts. And um, I think our staining was probably a little bit worse because we were using nails instead of wood dowels. And so, you know, you get a little bit of rust that comes through the panels and uh, can turn that staining a little darker. Um, <clears throat> we reached out to Woodworks to give us some suggestions on how to take care of the water staining that was on the panels because it was very noticeable. This wasn't something where you were just going to kind of, uh, oh, it'll blend in, don't worry about it. This, this was bad. And uh, 
caused me a lot of stress, a couple of nights staring at the ceiling. And um, so Woodworks had given us some decent ideas. Uh, of course, they started with the easiest. Hey, why don't you consider wiping it? Okay, well, I'd already done that. And then they said, well, you may consider pressure washing it. And I didn't really want to do the pressure washing because if you've ever pressure washed your deck, uh, you know that it makes it kind of fuzzy looking. And I, I didn't want that look. I still I wanted everything to be nice and crisp and intentional. Um, and uh, the next thing they said was they, they had a, another project where they were able to make uh, a mixture of water and OxyClean. And they were able to take a lot of that stuff off. So I went to an area that wasn't going to be seen and did a test area. And it, it did help with the staining some, probably made it 50% better. But it also had a, an added side effect that it made the wood look darker by a couple of shades. So um, it wasn't a situation where I could do some areas. I was going to have to do the OxyClean on the entire area so that it would all look consistent. And that was not um, acceptable to me either. So ultimately, I got up there. My daughter and I got on scaffolding and got up there close to it. And we very carefully sanded some areas. Um, I started off using an orbital sander. Um, I also had a belt sander there, but it was a little too aggressive. And then ultimately, uh, one of the best things I found was just using a grinder with a wire wheel on it and just using it very uh, surgically uh, to get the areas clean that I needed to. Um, the stairs at the very end of the, uh, the, the video you just watched, I was going down some stairs and we actually did the stringers of the stairs in a mass timber system as well. I, and I don't think that's ever been done anywhere, but if somebody wants to correct me, I'm all for it. But that was an idea that came from one of our employees that we did. And um, so I think um, I will go ahead and let George uh, start the second part of the video. And then of course, we'll take any, any questions there at the end. Anyway, the stairs are outstanding. Uh, it's the only one of its kind. We have, we have the mass timber stringers, Hopefully you guys saw all that stuff before. Um, all of this stuff was done locally and uh, through the efforts of our own employees to come up with this one-of-a-kind design. If you pan to the TV here, this is a time lapse. It shows basically uh, the progress. We, uh, we did construction through the second wettest spring in Springfield history, so it was truly a mud hole for a very long time, but uh, I'll uh, point out things as they happen here. So we have the foundation of the basement here. And this is an upper level area that's slab on grade. And so they're gonna start forming up the foundation walls that come across here. And as you're imagining all this, all of this area here is going to be a building that is elevated. So we'll see that here in a moment. And through some snow. This portion of the wall right through here actually has a form liner in it that uh, kind of ties in with the metal panels on the exterior of the building. And we're getting ready to start some uh, steel erection. We're framing up. This is the area where the fitness center was. The garage is over here. Starting to put some of the steel up. And then it's almost time for the big truss to show up. Big truss. So this is uh, one Barrendale truss this way. The other one is going this direction. Something that was very tricky about this is that we had to pre-deflect the second 
bare deal truss before we welded it into place. Uh, that was very tricky. You don't see it here uh, because there was some, some jacks and stuff and whatnot down below that we uh, had to put in place after we got the metal deck on them and did a little readjustment there. So a lot had to happen in this slab here. We actually did uh, an in-floor heating system, which I'll show a little bit more about here in a moment. There we go. We're starting to get the wire mesh in. Here we go. I see some tubes in there now. Now they're casting the uh, top slab. Put the metal roof deck on. Here comes the mass timber roof system. There's the wind blowing everything around. And finish framing over here. We uh, the original construction documents called for metal stud exterior framing. Uh, we went ahead and changed it to wood, and that was actually. Uh, for a couple reasons. One is we wanted the, the, it was a better performing wall from an energy saving standpoint to put the wood versus the metal studs. And uh, wood was actually cheap at the beginning of the year when we started this process. I know it went up by almost 40% by the time uh, July and August rolled around. Um, we did go with the zip system on the exterior of that. And uh, our building envelope folks were watching that the whole time. Uh, the TPO roof is going down over the top of the roof system. And then we have the metal panels going on. So there's two different kinds of metal panels. You can only see uh, the one kind uh, from this vantage point. Uh, so this was just true uh, horizontal metal panels. The other one was more of a, a Luca Bond type uh, system. Got our signage up. We had to jump through a few hoops in order to do this sign because there's actually another sign on the other side of the building. And the local ordinances said we could only have one sign. So we got that approved. A lot of stuff going on the inside at this point. Of course, we got the glazing up there. This uh, element here at the front canopy, this is a double L, and that is uh, part of our logo. Yeah, we're getting pretty close to the end. There's the final product. All right. So, looking over this way, <laughs> running off the people. Uh, we have the food that was offered tonight that you guys can't eat. Uh, but this area here it has a very special purpose. Um, this is actually going to be a, an education and training room. So Miller Engineering is huge in education, both for our own employees and for uh, architects and such. Uh, we want to make this to where architects come here, get their lunch and learn or their continuing education credits, and we want to bring in the speakers for that and just want to be the hub of education and that type of activity in our areas, what this area is all about. So out here, you kind of get the wow factor of how much this building is actually uh, suspended in the air. Uh, this is an outdoor employee work area, and uh, we have Wi-Fi out here and, and other amenities. Um, so roughly two-thirds of the building is, is suspended above the ground. And I mentioned earlier about the hydronic heating system in the floor slab. 
So anytime you have a slab like this that's exposed from the underside, you have to do something to temper that concrete because if someone is sitting there working at their desk, you can blow as much heat down on them as you want, but um, they'll still have cold legs and cold feet. And so we have a in-slab heating system uh, that keeps that at 70 degrees all the time and keeps our occupants comfortable. One of the elements that um, I promised that I would talk about in, uh, when we were coming up with our learning objectives was talking about architectural structural steel and those challenges. Uh, we had a lot of structural steel on this and we worked very closely with that fabricator. It was design fabrication here in Springfield and it was uh, a lot of conversations. It was a lot of um, actually going to their facility and talking with them and showing them, you know, they would do some welds and they would say, is this appropriate or not? And we would say, yes, we like this one. No, this one's not okay. We also had to have a very lengthy conversation about marking the beams. And I'll say that another way, not marking the beams. So we didn't want people coming in and seeing all the writing, all the beams. And so that's that proved to be difficult for them. And there were some areas where they could hide the, the markings and some areas where they couldn't. And they uh, had to be more clever about it using paper tacks, for example, versus writing actually on the beam. And then you have this whole other level, once you actually get that fabricated, of educating your erectors and telling them, don't walk on the beams when they're on the trailer. Don't, don't track mud up over everything. And uh, when you're doing layout, use chalk versus, uh, you know, some kind of a crayon. And um, so we were decently successful at that. It, 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 there are still a few marks up there, but honestly, it gives it a, just enough character to where it really looks good. But uh, man, what a, what a thing that was to try to get everyone educated. And, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy how much you talk to a manager or someone that's in charge and how much none of that gets to anybody else. And so you have to uh, just be watching a lot and, and have those conversations. Um, we, uh, we talked about a lot of different finishes on the steel. So obviously everyone knows you can paint steel, you can prime it and paint it. We definitely did not want that. Um, when steel comes from the mill, it has mill scale on it. And when it sits out in the yard of a fabricator, it gets rust all over it. And then you have to decide, are you going to live with that? Or are you going to have a wire? Or are you going to grind it? Or are you going to sandblast it? Uh, we even considered uh, doing an annealing process where you put, uh, uh, let's see, linseed oil. Linseed oil on, a, on the structure and heat it up, which is similar to what you do when you're, uh, say, for example, uh, working with cast iron. Uh, even with cast iron cookware, when you're seasoning it, it'd be a similar process to that. After trying out a lot of things, we just decided to leave it alone, uh, primarily because of the fact that we could not um, guarantee that we would get a uniform finish over here versus over there. And so that was very important to us. So just leave it alone. Let it do what it's going to do. So that was a big part of it. As far as the vibration goes, we were very successful at controlling the vibration. There is still a small amount, but the good news is we have lots of options available to us, and we already anticipated that there would be some. Uh, there's something that's uh, referred to as a tuned mass vibration absorber, and that's where you go to various locations where you're feeling vibration, and you actually hang weight from a spring. And so when the vibration comes there, uh, the springs do the work of dampening um, or damping. Dampening is what you do with water. Damping is what you do with, with vibrations. So I it's the wrong term there. But um, So we might try a few other things. It's, it's certainly very livable here. There's, there's anything like that. And uh, so we're very happy with how that turned out. Um, I think I might take you into the mechanical room real quickly, and you might see some people trying to escape. It's just people that we keep in the basement, <laughs> not to be worried. Okay, flee! <laughs> <laughs> These 
these are the people that have been helping out tonight. They've done a great job with our open house. Thank you so much. Uh, right behind me here, this is that uh, heat system in the floor that I was talking about. We have two zones. This one goes out to the break room area. This one goes out to the main space. I'm touching it. It feels warm. And uh, that's because it's starting to get cold here. Um, so again, uh, this, this goes out. And all of these are valves here uh, that go out at various rates, depending on how far out that uh, hot water has to go and then come back. And then this is the electric boiler that controls that. You can tell here that it's, this light would be red if it was running, but we've had great weather uh, here today, so nothing's happening. And then the uh, thermostat there is set to 70, which I mentioned earlier is where we keep it at. And then down here, we just have all kinds of mechanical stuff. We have four different uh, units that uh, tie into all those thermostats that I was talking about. Uh, we have washer and dryer here for our employees and also ties in with our fitness program. And then uh, over here we have all our data stuff. And I don't know how many miles of network cable we have, but it must be a million. And uh, so, yeah, this is our mechanic space. I wish you guys could ask me questions, uh, but you can't. And uh, I hope that this has been a educational session. Uh, we talked about the vibration. I know I was supposed to talk about that. Uh, the mass timber we talked about, it's a great system. Um, that day that we put in, that we installed all that stuff, that was 38,000 nails that we fired in 12 hours. Put all that together, it took a small army of people to do it, but it worked out great. And, um, see here what other elements should I talk about I think that's it thank you everybody for tuning in and I hope this has been great if you need a personalized tour of our office we'll do it anytime okay well that was the second half of the tour um, I would mention a couple other things uh, of course anybody can ask questions at any time um, the you might have noticed that the ductwork that's exposed on the main level um, is not painted. In fact, it's uh, we we kind of ordered something special there. When we decided to keep the structural steel raw, we thought that it would look silly to have galvanized ductwork that was all shiny, or even painted ductwork for that matter. And so we we went with a. A, that ductwork material that is intended to be painted. It has this sort of rough sheen to it, rough, not really sheen, rough, a rough texture to it, um, which makes it kind of look raw like the steel. And um, so that ductwork is intended to be painted, uh, but we intentionally left the paint off to keep that, uh, that dull finish. And then of course, uh, you also may have saw that some of that ductwork was oval shaped we uh, that was that was my my baby there. I wanted to make sure that nothing upstaged uh, the beautiful 70 foot long truss that was down through there. I didn't want anything else to be seen. So um, when we were trying to decide um, with, with structural steel being such an important part of this project, of course, we wanted to pick just the right fabricator for that project. And so. Here in Springfield, we have three or four to choose from. We have the large ones, we have the medium-sized ones, and we have the people that work out of their garage. And um, surprisingly, I guess, maybe we, we went with a medium-sized company. It was a company called Design Fabrication. Uh, I have had a relationship with those guys for over 20 years, and I, I they've changed ownership and whatnot over the years, but they still do good work, and I felt like I could trust them. And of course their price was, was good as well. And um, their main fabrication shop is right at 80 feet long. And so they were constructing this 70 foot long truss inside that shop. And you know they would lay it down flat, weld everything they could from one side, and then they would go through this process of flipping it over inside their shop. And they were literally trying not to knock outlets off the wall when they were flipping this thing over. It was so tight inside that uh, fabrication space. Um, 
but they did a great job. And, and um, I really felt like I was a team member with them. Their, their people wanted me to come by multiple times and look at stuff and, and, and they wanted approval and they wanted to do it right. And of course, I think many of them were actually at the open house to see the finished product as well. So um, that's a couple other things. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions or comments uh, that they'd like? To I have add? one for you, Travis. Um, um, now that you've been in the space since November, is there anything else that you would have changed or done differently? You know, you talked a lot about the mass timber issues and stuff, but is there anything else that has kind of surfaced that you may have changed? The one part of my building that I don't currently like is the fact that um, we have commercial toilets here and they're not the type that, you know, they don't have a, a tank. It's, it's the, what you would see at a commercial building. Um, and you can hear toilets flush from just about anywhere in this office. It really is loud. I have come to hate those toilets. So maybe someday I will change those out. I'm not sure. Um, other things. So Zern needs to come up with a quiet flush valve is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, of course, with, with every project, there's going to be a few hitches and glitches. Uh, I came in one Saturday and I heard this racket coming from down in the basement in the mechanical room. And I went down there and there's water all over the place. And there's all this water hammering going on. This bizarre stuff was happening. And uh, it turns out that the uh, mechanical contractor, um, had not really done anything to regulate the pressure from the street. Uh, there was no pressure regulator in there. And so we were getting way too much pressure to the building. And so they had to come in and fix that. Um, we, uh, we have that fitness center area over there, but that's actually intended for future growth. And the fitness center will move to a different, different location uh, um, when that time comes. Uh, but I'm really enjoying the fitness center over there. And I hope we don't grow, grow that fast because I, I really want to continue to enjoy it for a little bit longer. But um, any other questions? Uh, Lynn just asked, kind of tagging on that one, is there anything that you do differently next time? Maybe design-wise? Well, design-wise, um, we were really fortunate that we caught wood prices when we did. I, I was kind of complaining in this video. And, and if I take what I know now and apply it to several months ago, I have nothing to complain about. Um, the, um, the wood, the mass wood timber system was difficult to do because no one around here knew how to do it. And we were kind of figuring it out as we went. And then uh, if there was any one thing that I would have done differently, it would have been, I would have paid a lot of money to have a roofer come out and put a roof over that mass timber system the day after it was installed uh, even if it was just temporary, um, because I fought that and I fought that and I fought that for months until we finally got a roof on it. And it was just agonizing for me personally, because we put so much time, so much effort into that. It turned out so beautiful. And then every time it rains, stain, stain, stain. Have you had any um, interactions with other designers or brought people over to see that mass timber in this area? Well, we have not. Uh, we had the open house and a lot of people were exposed to it there. Uh, we're, we're waiting for this COVID non nonsense to, uh, to get to the point where people are going to venture back out again. Uh, we're really close to that here where we are in the country anyway. I know others might be struggling, but just as soon as it makes sense, we are going to have a lot more people coming over. Um, and as, as the video said, we want to be the center of education for our area for architects and engineers. Um, and I think in, through that process, they'll, they'll have some exposure to it. Well, if that's everything for the day, thank you very much, Travis. It was very interesting even to watch it again. I, I got new insights even from November, things that I'd forgotten about. And, uh, Look forward to seeing it in person one of these days. Okay, sounds good. <laughs>